Hernan Diaz Alonso is principal and founder of Los Angeles-based firm Zephora Tech and the newly appointed SARG director and CEO. Prior to that, Hernan has been a distinguished faculty member and graduate program chair at SIARC since 2001. He has taught at Columbia's GSAP, the University of Applied Arts Vienna, and Yale University. He was the winner of MoMA's PS1 Young Architects Program competition and has re received numerous awards such as the Educator of the Year Award from the AIA, an wow. ARD Award for Emerging Architecture, and a Progressive Architecture Award. Hernan's architectural designs have been featured in exhibitions at the Venice Architecture Biennale, London Architecture Biennale, and Archilab in France. He is also part of the permanent collection of the Frack Center, SF MoMA, New York MoMA, the Thyssen Bornemisza Collection, the Mac Museum of Vienna, and the Art Institute of Chicago. We are at Sephora Tech to discuss the big and slow charming elephant in the room, one of Hernan's many nicknames for architecture. Hernan's controversial work is like Marmite. You either love it or hate it, but you can't be indifferent to it. The architectural provocateur and thinker has challenged the way we approach the contemporary discourse. He asks the question, does it look like I have a plan? And the answer is probably yes. And today we are going to shift the spotlight from the work and onto the architect himself. Hernan, thank you for letting me shake it and start it with you today. <clears throat> what do you believe was your starting point, your first architectural project? Well, depends how you want to depends how you want to read that. Um, meaning, project with capital P, or just a project? A project where you feel now you are the author, you own this work. Um, hmm. Probably, out of a lot of back and forth. So, if I have to settle for one, it's probably one we did a competition for the YouTube Tower in. In Dublin, I think it was 2002, 2003, something like that. Uh, don't remember exactly the year, but that, that would be the project I felt like, okay, we, we, we crack it up and we figured it out a couple of things along the way that I think it belonged to us. Um, before that, I think the work was, in many ways, influenced um, I would not go as far to call it derivative, but certainly heavily influenced by other people's thinking and so on, which I think is pretty much the way that any architect works. So I think it always takes you some time to start to figure out your own voice and back and forth, particularly in those times where the eruption of computations, computational thinking and methodologies and all that was really producing massive shift. So everybody was trying to accommodate their own work. So yeah, I would say that that's probably the project. You have previously said, we like to think that we don't pre-think our work, but we do. Yeah. And that thinking still matters. Technique is something else. What do you pre-think when you start the project? I think it's a little bit like any kind of evolution. There is a pre-think that happens in your brain, but also a pre-think or pre-logic that exists within the work. Um, what, what I said, or, what I, what I said along those lines I have to do with the idea that when we're working in a project, particular project, there's never really like an apparatus of thinking or pre-thinking specifically to that problem. That project comes as part of a larger lineage of things that you've been working. So specifically, yes, it's true that each individual project, I don't think or we don't think as a team as that particular problem, because, it, but at the same time, there is a whole series of ideas and logic you can work in. So, work by families or trajectories. So, there is something about that that is interesting. What, what I'm saying is, I'm not really interested in the notion to a kind of a manifesto or pre theoretical statement of the work. I'm much more interested in how the things move from one step to the other on the unraveling of doing the projects. So, that's not really that you're not thinking, it's just that you don't allow the rational thinking to be so heavily loaded on the front. And one of the questions that I was going to ask you later on was, you have liberated yourself from the idea of a manifesto, and why is that? Well, I really think, probably happens in any creative discipline, but particularly in architecture, we always trying to free ourselves from whatever else. I don't think you never, you never completely do it, like, uh, if you think about it when I'm talking to you right now, this is some sort of a manifesto. When, I, when, I, when I'm saying I've always been obsessed, not myself, I think, it's a gen, I think it's a whole group of people that I would call it the second or third generation that start to work with some of these toys. 
that we were much more focused in doing stuff than writing about it or pre-writing about it. So um, in that sense, I always work very hard to liberate myself from the manifesto because also, to be, to be, uh, to be fair, um, right or wrong, I consider that a very kind of um, Anglo-Saxon model of operating, which I am not. So uh, I come from a different part of the jungle in which uh, there are exceptions to every rule because one could say people like Aldo Rossi, Rafael Moneo, they are not Anglo-Saxon and they were really into the manifesto model. Uh, I just also think there is a kind of a much more simple human nature thing which is um, the manifesto model just doesn't fit me. It's not in my nature to operate like that. It's not in my nature to think like that. So it was kind of an opportunistic way also to go with what I have, which is to, to, to work in a kind of a more playful way, and which I think the manifesto is a powerful tool and I think it's a useful tool. Um, it, it kind of constrain or define, it preemptive this define and constrain certain things. So. Um, I never been interested in that idea. Um, still, I'm not interested in, even though I, um, I do interviews or I, I'll write an article, I say here or there. But it always a desire is to don't put a clear blueprint about what is what I want to do or so on. So I know it's, there is a kind of a contradiction there since I'm so heavily involved in academia, which you have to always plan in advance. So in a way. So I might, let's say I like more planning, or I, I like more um, set of guidance or rules more than I like manifesto. That but leads me to a question that I was going to ask. Uh, can you clarify the way you differentiate between research, experimentation, and speculations as ways of making architecture? Well, I think words, um, Words are very powerful tools, and sometimes we use them and we exchange them or interchange them like they are similar or by the default of using them. Uh, and again, bear in mind that uh, English is not my first language, so some, sometimes I use in my, own in my own benefit the misunderstanding or misconstruction of some of these words. What I'm trying to say is I think in every phase, of, in, in every stages, of, in different stages of careers of somebody's way of working or thinking. This is an experimental phase. Uh, and basically, for me, when you're experimenting, you, you have intuition, but you really don't know what you're doing. You're just experimenting with things. And some of them will stick, some of them will not. Research, uh, so exper experiments or experimental, I have less problems. Research is the one I don't like that much. Um, the reason why is because I think it, it, it always started with the necessity of architecture to to borrow models of operation that belong to other disciplines. So I think if you ask me about medicine or biology or all that, research seems much more clear to me because it has like a very clear goals and defined. The notion of architecture research, I always find it a little bit bogus because I have the feeling that we always do like a very bad, what we do is certain kind of sampling or data collection, which I'm not so sure if that constitutes research, but mostly, there is something phonetically wrong for me because research seems like the work is too easy to be discarded. So you're researching, like you're still looking for things, uh, which we all do in a way. But I like the notion of speculation anymore, much more, because I think a speculation, to speculate about something, is already you have an apparatus, you have an understanding. There is a disciplinar armature. There is a... There's certain things that are already in place that are common language and we all know what they are and then you can speculate about them in different ways and so on. So I like the notion of speculation much more because I think, I don't think architecture has that much room for new things or almost any. It's more about innovation. So I, I like that, I think I like, that's why I think speculating about something seems like a more proper than research. And experiments, I think, uh, being 46 years old and been doing this for almost half of my life by now, actually no, half of my life. I don't know. It will, it, it will be. It will sound. It will be incredibly <laughs> immature to still be experimental, because it means that you don't know what you're doing. And I think we can be more aggressive, less aggressive, more edgy, less edgy. But we know what we're doing at any given time. But that's why I like speculation way more than I like uh, and the word experimental or research. But also those things. Um, 
I don't know, these things, when, when I talk about these things, it's because they're interviews like this, or I, it's not something I'm thinking all the time, or I'm thinking, oh, are we being experimental or speculative? Um, I think most of the people don't think about themselves that way. Like, I never thought the work that we do was experimental, never thought that the work we do is visionary. Um, other people think that, to me, is the most logical answer to a problem that is being posed to us. So it's not that we are trying to provoke every time or anything like that. It's, that's the way I see the world, and that's the way I want the buildings to be or my vision of the world to be. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe other people feel differently. But that's always has been my feeling when, when you're in discussions and review with very sophisticated and prominent and cutting-edge architects. They see themselves as very rational people. They, you know what I mean? Like, they don't see themselves like that. So I, I, it's, it's a funny thing that, I mean, like, uh, it's a funny thing, especially in, this, in these times. You say you've never touched a computer before GSAP. Yeah. How has the digital transformed your approach to architecture? Was the tool just a different tool, or was there a shift to a new paradigm? Uh, well, it had phases. Um, I think it took me a while to fully understand the depth of it. Um, like everybody else, probably my first intuition was that these were amazing tools. Then as you evolve and mature with the project with Capital P, you realize that there are more than tools, that there is a whole different logic come to play. Um, there is a whole series of possibilities that, that span the horizon what you can do. I became completely committed to it to a point like, if you look around our office, you're going to see there's almost no sketches, no paper, there's not all, even physical models. So we are, I'm very committed to it. Um, and I think it produces a very particular kind of work, and I think it liberates the kind of work. Now, then it becomes always like an egg chicken kind of thing. Do I do what I do because I've been working with computers, or I work with computers because I do what I do? Uh, I really don't bother though that much with the things. I think it opened a whole series of possibilities for me. But mostly, in my, in my specific case, I think that there is a, there's a larger discussion that can happen at the, at the large discipline thing, which is a different conversation. But in my own particular case, it was also a, a very amazing, almost ideological apparatus, which allowed me to merge my old cinematic animation desires of early on in my life to the reality of being an architect and how those things can be integrated. So for me, that opened a whole new series of possibilities. So yeah, no, I never considered them tools. I still don't consider them tools. I think they are ideologically charged. I think they have a high level of involvement in what you do. I think there is a, there is a kind of a partnership with it. Um, I don't think that this point applies that much anymore, but I used to say a while ago, that uh, I think that one of the fundamental reasons was I think that people, I mean, you take people like Zaha Hadid or Frank Gehry or Tom Main or Eric Moss, which they've done very sophisticated use of computer technology. My feeling is the approach was always what they think can do for me. And I think myself and people who pioneer, pioneered this before me, like people like Greg Lynn or Bernard Cash or Lars Spybrook. But the approach was more much, okay, what, what can I do for you? It was more like, it became more like a partnership thing. So I think after a while, I, now I think it has become in such the canon and such the standard, that actually we don't think that much anymore. I, I don't think if you ask any of these guys who are interning here in the summer or Ivan who are with me, I don't even think that they're bothered with these questions in their head. You know, this is just part of what they are. I mean, it's, it belongs more to people like me who transition from one to another one. So it's... So um, I'm not so sure that apply to younger people, or people who started later with computers, this, this is kind of dichotomy. For me, it was, was a massive, a massive radical change. And in pragmatic terms, as I said, there was a possibility to negotiate my cinematic ambitions with that, number one. Uh, and the other one was, it was a really good way to move away for like a, a high level of influence that Enric Mirage's work had at some point in my work. Computer was a way to start to find my own voice and how to negotiate that. And more recently, one of the things I find the most fascinating about computers is it allows the discipline to be able to produce new coherences. Uh, so to me, this is the most radical thing, that you can put very different way of thinking and put in the computer 
and something new will be reintegrated in a completely innovative way. Mm. So, um, anyway. Uh, something I was surprised to learn was when you used to draw by hand, you've always worked with a triangle and a compass. Mm -hmm. For you, it had to be a precise geometrical drawing. So even before computers, it, precision was important to you. And when you were talking about the Renaissance, you mentioned that they sought perfection with imperfect tools. Yeah. Do you believe we have the perfect tools now, and do you seek perfection? Uh, I, I don't seek perfection, but what, what, what I was saying there, there was a very interesting fascination of flip of the coin in terms of ultimate goals. Like in a way, the Renaissance was to achieve perfection. I mean, of course, because many of the, many of the buildings and projects that we know from that time were some sort of related to religion. So there was certain desire of perfection achievement through those symbols, but nevertheless was the case. And I think it's not that we have the perfect tools, but clearly software can produce perfect geometries in the, at the mathematical level at least. And I think there's a more, more latent desire to throw it off or contaminate it and produce imperfection out of that. Um, I'm always been interested, not in the notion of imperfection, but I've always been interested in the notion of uh, the kind of um, something that is off. Uh, and the reason why that is because I'm, I'm interested in form, and as such, one way or another, you're interested in the point of form. It's about aesthetics. If you say about aesthetics, it relates, it relates to the point of beauty. But what defines the contemporary sense of beauty, I think, me mechanisms of contamination or mechanisms of certain wildness or certain uncanniness or weirdness or however you want to call it is part of it. So no, I've never been interested in perfection, but I've always been interested in precision. I've always been obsessed about precision. Um, probably this is the part that analog computer didn't matter. To me, always was about this obsession. And all the people that I admire in architectural field always been obsessed about precision and virtuosity to understand too. I'm not saying that precision and virtuosity are in the same category all the time. But more often than not, if you're interested in virtuosity, you have to have precision. Uh, I think you can have precision without virtuosity, but I don't think you can have virtuosity without precision. So for me, precision and the construction of precision, or whether the language of precision always has been, if you ask me, it's probably the most clear obsession in, 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 in any phase of the work and in any phase of the teaching, for that matter. Oversaturation of geometry is a quality that's important to you. At what point did you move from geometry to form? Well, I don't think, uh, I think we also, uh, to, be, to be perfectly honest, I think right now geometry is less a driving force and more a byproduct. I think it has been much more the construction of the totality of form and through the possibility of images. I mean, one of the most things that fascinates me the most about technology is that I think everything that we produce is, Im is driven by image. And I don't say this in a superficial way or in a bad way. I'm not talking about <laughs> reality TV or the Kardashians images. It's not about that. It's uh, the literality of the production of images. And even when you do a drawing, it's really an image of a drawing. And this may be like a very reductive way of thinking, but to me, a drawing with capital D is when you would do it by hand. The moment that you do it with the computer, it's an image of a drawing. So even when we're doing drawings, to me, are not really drawings anymore. They're images. But also, I think one of the transformations is I think we work, for good or for bad, we have a much more holistic way to understand the problems. I mean, as I said, I was educated with that model in which you will construct the plan and then the sections and the model, so you will build them by pieces. So geometry was absolutely crucial. It still is, but in many, many ways, I work in a much more holistic way and I work much more with predefined things or predefined forms and carving and butchering and other things. So. I think the world has become much more driven by form or, or masses or overall, or over, no, masses, no, overall form than geometry. Now, geometry still is there. It's a latent thing. It's a, it's a mechanism of control, but I don't think it's any more a mechanism, a mechanism of generation in the world. It hasn't been for a while. Resolution is a word you associate with your work. How would pixelating your work affect our understanding of it? Um, when you were asking about perfection, I'm always obsessed with high resolution. Uh, there are, there's a lot of people who are interested in these days in high res, low res. I don't have that interest. I'm completely obsessed in high resolution. Even when we're trying to produce imperfections, they're always high resolution and perfection. So 
we always try to work at the highest level of pixelation. That is, um, yeah, no, I, as much as I find the conceptual appealing, the low res, every time that we try something with it, it doesn't work. So that's why I've been using butchery or ritual as a mechanism to bring conceptual low resolution or brutal or a combination of high end, low end, like uh, butchery is a kind of a very brutal thing, but also it's very precise. So I always try to find these mechanisms of contamination as a way to get closer to some sort of a low resolution frame in it, but uh, I cannot pull it off. I mean, I always something in the back of my head that always bring in my, always push me into the high resolution. I think there is, uh, there, many of the things I think is ba they're based on very, very simple things or very simple stories. Um, I think when, when I started working with the computers, they were very slow, so to produce a great render will take you a long time. So you develop a desire for high resolution because you couldn't achieve it. Now, high resolution has become something fairly fast to achieve. Um, so that's what probably other people are much more obsessed to produce low resolution. But uh, in the back of my head, I mean, high resolution was always the goal. Still is. How do you balance between the notion of the familiar versus the unfamiliar? Um, I don't know, because I don't think there are that much room for unfamiliar anymore. I think there are just degrees of familiarities. I think they're more familiar and less familiar. It's the same thing that we talk about avant-garde or cutting edge. I, I don't know what, what else is left right now to be avant-garde. You know? I think we live in a culture and society. I'm not saying commercially successful, but I think we live in a society and a culture that is willing to accept pretty much anything. Uh, that doesn't mean that you will make more money or this or that. That's a different story. But conceptually, um, so I'm not so sure with unfamiliar anymore. I think each of us, we work with unfamiliarity with our own familiarity. So something that to me is unfamiliar, it, does, it will not be unfamiliar at large. It's just unfamiliar within my own work or my own way of thinking. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, like... To me, having the tattoos in my arm was an unfamiliar moment. Now, compared with other people, this is just familiar in a much more soft degree. You know what I mean? So in my family, probably it's unfamiliar because there's nobody else who had tattoos. But in Los Angeles, you know what I mean? So I, 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 the all, thing, all, all those things are degrees. I think we all are in... I think the familiar and unfamiliar have to do with the desire of innovation. I think anybody who, who works on the creative fields you're always looking for an edge. You're always looking for something that can bring new air to your own work and new possibilities to the new work. And I think that's why the unfamiliar became a useful tool. Not so sure you can really achieve something that is really unfamiliar or something that you've been working for so long. You know what I mean? Like it's the same thing I was telling you when I've been doing this for half of my life, but specifically this body of work for 16 years already or 15 years already. I taught in the best place in the world. I teach in one of the best schools in the world. I'm going to become the director of one of the... I'm an established guy. I'm not a provocateur. I mean, you cannot be a provocateur when you've been doing it for so long and the work is there and, and the students work with you in your office. I mean, okay, it's true. We, we, have, we don't build that much or we have the thing. So let's say in the commercial idea of mainstream, yes, that may be... But this is the same with familiar and familiar. So maybe yes. In the culture at large, uh, maybe some of what we do is unfamiliar, but in the culture of a place like Sai or places away or museums or other things where I operate, I don't think it's unfamiliar anymore. I think it's a different kind of familiarity. It's, more, it's maybe a more pervert, perverse family, but it's familiar. Fashion is about trends. Yeah. You're okay with work that looks outdated. Mm -hmm. Is that to say you're not affected by current trends? Oh, I'm super affected by current trends. I'm, 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 I'm follow current trends a lot. I pay attention to it. I just don't think you, any of us have all the capacity all the time to accept all the trends, or, you, or do you have to accept all the trends? I'm, I'm always interested in... One of the things fascinating things about architecture is how much it bridge between tradition and innovation. This is one of the things I've obsessed about. A lot of my work is... It has a certain romantic tainted things that they belong to very old ideas. And I'm fascinated by that and there, and some other part of the work is very fascinated with super now contemporary ideas. So no, I, I have no problem with the, with the work looking aging. 
Actually, I believe in any work, all work age. I think that this, this is one of the myths contracted when people say, oh, certain architecture is ageless. It's not true from my point of view. Like when you go to Bill Savoie or Villa Roche or Le Corbusier, it blows you away because you know that they were done in a particular period of time. Like if somebody will build Bill Savoie today, it's not really that interesting. What makes it Bill Savoie so fascinating is it happens in that year, in that moment, in that time. So it is attached to time. It's, nothing is timeless. Now, there are certain values about great architecture that are timeless. But the pieces itself, I don't believe that are timeless. I think there are things that are extraordinary, and because they're extraordinary, they remain relevant, but that doesn't make them timeless. Like, well, I don't know, if you listen to new classical music, Beethoven or Mozart or Bach or Wagner or whatever, sorry, Wagner, no, because it's ever, but all the other ones. To me, it's not that when people say they're timeless. To me, they're not timeless. They belong to, that's what they call classical music. It belongs to a particular time. Now, it's still a wonderful to listen to them, it's still important. Do they represent these times? For me, they don't. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna listen or I'm not gonna go to the Walt Disney Concert Hall and see a concert. But if I want to, if I want to pay, and, and I'm probably, I, 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 I'll prefer, let's say, for sure I prefer to listen to Beethoven than to listen to Easy, whatever, or Jay-Z, or whatever it is. And I probably would prefer it, that, that does, but that doesn't mean that that makes it more relevant or more current. So it's a delicate balance. You pay attention to things. But I'm totally comfortable with that idea. I mean, when somebody says, oh, that's fashionable, like it's an insult, I don't find it insulting at all. I think the fashion, the fashion industry as such is one of the most important cultural shapers in this time and age. Then there is good fashion and bad fashion. There's good architecture. So doing a glass box today, is that timeless? I don't think so. I think it's completely retrograde and conservative. Doing something funky in form, is that timeless or contemporary? I don't think so. There will be good ones and bad ones. So it depends. It depends. And there's no one way to read those things, and I don't think we should claim to read those things. Now, I have my own interests, and I have the, the things that trigger my imagination, and they have to do with certain tendencies and certain trends, and not all the trends trigger my imagination. You said before that you don't build a discourse alone. Who yeah. or what has helped you build yours? Ooh, it's a long list. I mean, uh, there are people who are being direct influence, Enrique Mirages, Greg Lynn, Peter Eisman, Jeff Kibnis, Jesse Reiser, Bernard Schumi, Tom Main, Eric Moss, Frank Gehry, Saha Hadid, you see, and the list goes on. My peers, my colleagues, I mean, Tom Wiscom, Marcelo Spina, David Rue, uh, Florencia Pita, Elena. I mean, you, it's, it's many things. And sometimes they're conscious, some of the things you pay attention, some of the you don't. Um, you, you don't believe the students don't work with you. I mean, it's a lot, a, lot, a lot of discoveries come from you may have an intuition about something, and then you work with the students, and the students figure it out, and then you appropriate it and you use it in your own work. That's, um, there are many things, but also. Francis Bacon, Alexander McQueen, Tim Burton, Christopher Nolan, David Fincher, is uh, John Galliano, which is bad word this day, but he was extraordinary at one point. Uh, uh, David Sally, uh, Fabio Marcaccio, Matthew Barney. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of people you construct the discourse with. As I said, there are people who do more in dialogue than other ones, and some of them just come to personal relations and friendships people that you spend time talking with them, Wolf Briggs. I mean, this, this is all been big influence in, in, in my way of thinking and how you construct the discourse. Um, I think I'm very coherent. I mean, all the people I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll name to you, they all have a certain attitude towards the, the world and towards architecture. And, and, and I'm leaving out a lot of other people that I'm pretty sure. Um, and even you learn about people that you dislike or you will consider their work antagonist it, but you construct a discourse by opposition. Um, but yeah, no, it's, yeah, you don't build the discourse alone. Actually, you contribute to a piece of a much more larger discourse, at best. In a conversation you had with Bernard Schumi at Sire, you said that you don't archive work, but you have a storage unit full of old phones and laptops. Mm -hmm. What role does your past play in what you do now? 
for sure plays a role. I just don't pay attention to it. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not very... The past doesn't interest me that much. I probably have to do with other kind of anxieties about life. Um, at the end of the day, look, you can say all the cliches. At the end of the day, your chest, the sum of all your past. But uh, I don't really don't pay attention too much. I have zero nostalgia. I mean, if you, if you look around in our office, in my office, there's not almost any evidence of previous work or anything. I only have one copy of a monograph. I'm, I have no, no much nostalgia. I don't, I mean, archive digitally for work reasons, but you don't see frames of projects or anything. No, I, I, I don't like, but also I don't like personal nostalgia either. I mean, I don't like the past much. I don't like to think about the past much. I, um, I have no interest on my own, on my own trajectory. I, yeah. uh, that, I think that's probably, I'm not so sure that's a good thing, uh, but that's how it is, I think. Uh, I don't know, I've never been convinced about the, the relevance of what, of what we do. You know, it's just it's what you do. And I don't know, I, I always thought that it's something weird about architects and artists and so on. Like, like if you're a plumber or you're, you're moving containers in the, in the port, you're not going to be thinking about archiving or your own past or whatever. I don't know, there's always been something weird about that thing, which I, I, I never, it, it probably is a genetic thing, it's a family thing. My father was very bad with that too. He came from Spain, moved to Argentina, and never, never talked about his past. Actually, I found a lot of things about him after he died, and about things that he never told me or whatever. So I think it's also, I think it's a family thing, like, which we don't pay that much attention of any kind of past. So it's not just the world past. It's, it's one thing I hate the most about doing lectures or have to prepare a book or something is to go back through all the things that you've done. And it's not that I. I always joke that I hate everything that we, I do. It's not true. It's not that I hate. I just lose interest in it. It's just what I was doing 10 years ago doesn't really interest me. That, that is one of, I, I will say it's one of the main, main handicaps I have as an architect because architecture takes so long. It's always very difficult for me to keep an interest going. So even the few projects that sometimes we get to the point and we'll get built or not, I have to work myself into getting follow it and get interested in. Um, so that's probably related to this thing about the past. I, I lose interest on in things fairly fast. In relation to the past, you said, I'm not obsessed with historical references. Yeah. That's fucked up. Uh, do you engage with historic precedents or do you cast them aside? Um, I say this with arrogance. I know a lot about architecture. I know a lot about the history and discipline. I have no interest whatsoever to fold it into my work. It's in the back of my head, it's part of my high drive, it gives me a lot of repertoire, it comes in and out, and then the, I can send to somebody, oh, look at, look at how Corbu did this in that house, or look at how Mirage did this or that, and so on. I have it in my head. I never, I don't, I'm not interested in the, in the intellectual conceptual exercise to be in a permanent dialogue with the past or, or presence. I think you do it anyway because our discipline is so heavy, it's like an elephant, you cannot erase the memory, so it's there. Uh, just don't use it as a mechanism of production. I always try to to be as free as I can for any other things. I don't understand the obsession of many architects and the discipline at large to operate in that way. Um, I always find it all borderline necrophilia. Uh, I don't know, it, it seems like a weird thing to me. Don't get me wrong, I think it's incredibly important and this is very, very important. I think you have to know it. You have to, uh, and I think there are moments and times for it. I think in the school it's a good tool and you should learn it and if you have, I'm not so sure presence is so important. I think it's very important to understand the genealogy of things. Um, but I totally for the idea of historical knowledge and totally for, for discipline and knowledge. I'm not so sure that the project is good or bad because they have a very clear dialogue, a very clear lineage with some historical present. I, I never saw it. Now, I don't think there's other way to learn either. I mean, like when you look at, I don't know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Rolling Stones and Keith Richards. They will not exist without Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry. So there's an important thing about that. But at some moment, then you, you became your own guy and you keep doing your thing. And it's good to understand it, but if it's, it became something more 
osmos, uh, osmosis base or genetic base, I found it more interesting. He became like an intellectual exercise. How do you view the current and future role of the architect? Uh, who knows? I mean, th those questions are impossible to answer. Uh, what architects are we talking about? What architect are we talking about? Are they all architects equal? Are they all playing the same role? I don't think so. Um, architecture is one of the few disciplines. If you take like the major disciplines that have been for centuries in the world, like architecture, engineer, lawyers, doctors, there probably are more, but let's say those four. Architecture is the only one that is still the definition of architects covers everybody. In the other one, you will be an electrical engineer or bio engineer or civil engineer, whatever. You will be a brain surgeon or a proctologist or whatever it is that you do in medicine. In law, you will do civil law, real estate law, penal law, whatever. We are the only one that the word architects covers everybody. So when we talk about what is the role of the architect today, I mean, is again, what kind of architects are we talking about? The one, the one I pay attention, the one I'm interested in, the one that I, I aspire to be or I aspire the people I know to be, it has to be a culture and society sh shaper, somebody who can change and influence the world. Um, I think it has to relate to beyond just buildings. I think architecture is a way to understand society, world, cities, and culture. So I want the architects to be cultural producers. I want architectures, architecture to be seismographers. Um, and I hope that that's come to the future. Now the idea of the traditional architect and so on building seems to be losing terrain. Now that may be that always was like that. I mean, maybe also in the Renaissance was like that. I mean, 1940 was, or 1930 was like that. And we like to think at that time architects as a movement were more important. I don't know if that's the case or not, because history tends to remember things in a part peculiar way. Um, so I think the role, I think the role of architecture, then of an architect, probably more than anything else, is to be uh, a cultural shaker, a cultural provocateur, a cultural shaper, more than anything else. I think building is one part of being an architect or, or, be, or architecture. I think there is a way larger way to think about that, and I hope that architects will get more involved in other things. Um, at the same time, there is something really paradoxical about it, which I'm not so sure how many extraordinary buildings a city can take, right? I mean, I think there's a certain benefit in the anonymous, generic things, ugly things that get built. I don't know, it's, it's one of the things that, um, but mostly an, archi an architect should be an active, active cultural engine. To I mean, do their thing, which is, I don't think, I know that, I know that the, I'm in the minority on this, but I don't think an architect needs to be that different than what a musician does, or an artist does, or a filmmaker does. Um, I understand that buildings, in the traditional sense, come attached with the capital, comes attached with function or certain services they need to provide. But I think the fundamental essence of architecture it should be as useless in practical terms as a film is or art is. We have to do with the elevate our humanities, our possibilities, what, what, what we can achieve as a race. Um, I know that that's not the main core understanding of what architecture is, but that's the one I try to grasp to, 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 to and, and, and it's important that many of the things I'm saying here, I'm talking about my own work as an architect, I'm not talking necessarily as an educator. I think when you, when you are in the role of an educator and when you're in the role of leading a program or leading a school, your vision needs to be more open than your own. I mean, you have to be mar, much more um, tolerant about different ways to see it. So you cannot, I mean, this, what I'm talking about, they are my own understanding as my own, as me as an architect or my little office or whatever it is, um, I think when you lead an institution, you, you have to have a very clear umbrella of what you want this institution to be, but also you have to allow different possibilities. So when, when I'm talking about what an architect should be or it is or it should be in the future, I'm talking my own take about my own desires. I think at the school level, I think we have to have more than one definition. And that's why I think it's important to have extraordinary faculty and extraordinary people helping you in shaping so there is more than one vision about what an architect is.
talking about institutions and to bring this conversation to an end, I was going to ask you how you define the new, but in spirit of the symposium that is about to take place at SciArc, let me reword the question and ask, how do you define the now and what's the now to you? Well, I mean, it's good that you reframe because I have no interest in the new because I don't think architecture is capable of new. So now, this is something I'm, I'm very, I've been very obsessed for uh, quite some time, which is, and it relates to some of the questions that we were talking before, I, this idea of experiment and research and so on, I think we are way past that. Um, I think we all, all of us that were working in, and uh, certainly a school like SIAG is doing and that, and most of the faculty are doing that, working to really find the edge of what architecture is or shouldn't be. It has to be, it has to be done from understanding that you only operate in the now. You can understand everything you want about the past, you try to anticipate the future as much as you can, but you can only operate from the now. Your understanding of the world, the understanding of any, anything and everything, it starts from the now. So for me, the now is not one thing, it's many things, but it's that the idea is how urgent we want to make these topics. So my, the ambition in particular about the now in relation to symposium and idea is how we take this idea, all this body of work that many of us are working, that is understood outside the doors of an institution like SciArc as completely visionary or avant-garde or all that, which already established that none of that's true anymore how that became the way that we understand the now, how we shape the now. At the same time, there is a high level of confusion, which is a fascinating time to be an architect, and probably this always was the case. Uh, architecture always is in a state of confusion and contradiction and all that. Um, but I think there is something really powerful about the idea of the now, and in particular, the symposium is more about based on a series of patterns, emerging patterns and intuition than say, okay, all the things are going on. What do we do now? Where we are right now? Can we grasp? Can we try to define certain four or five things that we should be concerned more than other ones? So for me, the now is about defining possibilities. It's about focusing what it is and how you shape what you do it in an urgent immediacy that have it now. So in very practical terms, is how we move this idea to be understood as visionary or cutting edge or provocation to say, no, no, this is right now. This is what right now is going on. This is what it is right now. This is how society is. So the, for me, now is a horrible game. It's how, because by the way, that's what you do. I mean, you only work in the now. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, you're working now in a project that maybe get built two, three, four years from now, but you're working from the now. So this idea that, as I said, if you look at the disciplinary discussion, we always so obsess about past presence, past presence and all that, historical reference and all that, and we always trying to move. It's either that or it's visionary work and it's 50 years from now, but at the end of the day, the only thing we do is now. So it's, it's a fascinating thing when you look at films or cities, like when you look Blade Runner or 1981, that's how they thought that the LA would look now. Didn't, didn't come even close. That was an fiction. When you go in a city like Tokyo, Tokyo today is a city that modernism thought, the modernism will look, the future will look from the 60s, but it didn't become that, it became something else. So it's an interesting thing. So now it's the only thing that should matter right now. Fernand, I know your schedule is completely packed, so thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.